At last count, the U.S. government said there were 10 million job openings in the country. And while help wanted signs are common in retail or office based businesses, they're becoming more frequent in America's police departments. Changing political climate, accelerated retirements, and the inherent dangers of the job have created those openings, and more are on the way. According to Career Explorer, the U.S. will need to hire more than 20,000 officers by 2026. So many departments are taking extreme recruiting measures to get cops on the beat. Seattle, which lost hundreds of police officers after the city's 2020 unrest, is offering hiring bonuses of up to $30,000 and $7,500 for new recruits. Indianapolis has a $10,000 bonus for new recruits and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis recently signed a bill in April offering $5,000 bonuses to new police officers. So we have two takes from the thin blue line this morning. First is someone who is actively recruiting officers, Captain Forrest Bohannon and Director of Background and Recruitment Division for the Sandy Springs Police Department near Atlanta here in Captain Bohannon, welcome. We appreciate you and you being here. And let me just start right off with uh, how has the political environment uh, and politics in general affected the police profession and your efforts to recruit new officers? Well, good morning and thank you for having me. Um, so the political environment is not all inclusive, um, but has definitely played a part in the exit of police officers from the profession. But we also had a pandemic that um, assisted with that. So we've seen a lot of resignations and we're competing with the corporate world for a lot of these jobs that are out there. And we're also having families that are worried about their loved ones at work when they're watching on television and seeing bricks thrown at police officers and frozen water bottles, long hours being worked and less time with the families. So we don't always see the positivity and fulfillment of the profession. We're seeing a lot of the negatives and that's influencing people to not want to become police officers and to leave the profession as a whole. That's a really good point. Well, you know, and hundreds of departments like yours are offering now big cash bonuses. Um, so how competitive is it out there for you and your department to attract officers? You all seem to be trying for the same working pool. Yeah, so we're all competing for the same applicant pool and we're also competing with work from home environments and corporate America. So we're still receiving a lot of applications. However, the qualified applicant pool has shrunk a little bit from the caliber of applicants that we were seeing prior to 2020. Um, for example, our department, we saw about 400 applications in this past year, and we've only hired 4% of those applications. So we are competing for the same applicants. And, you know, sometimes we just need to pivot and how we're recruiting these people and what we're able to offer them compared to other agencies. Well, and beyond money, um, what's a selling point that Sandy Springs is using to attract officers? And I should mention to those who aren't familiar, Sandy Springs is a beautiful suburb of, of Atlanta, a great place to live. So what are you doing besides offering cash? So our biggest is that we're supported by our elected officials and we're supported by our community. So that's a big, big recruitment tactic that we like to um, used to recruit officers from out of state and from also in state. Um, what's important to know is our profession is just as noble as it was 20 years ago when I filled out my police application. And there are many people out there that still have the heart to want to serve and that have served in the past and may want to come back. And we want to attract those applicants to Sandy Springs. And Georgia, you know, we all know is seen as a conservative leaning state, one that is a strong supporter of law and order. So does that play a part, that reputation or image play a part in recruiting uh, new officers? Yes, absolutely. Like I said, we're supported by our elect elected officials and we're supported by the management of our city to go out there and do our jobs and keep our community safe. And that's a big selling point of why people want to come work for City of Sandy Springs. Well, Captain Forrest Bohannon from the Sandy Springs, Georgia Police Department, thank you for what you do and thank you for joining us this morning. We really appreciate you. Thank you.
One of the most devastating was Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. Lieutenant General Russell Honore uh, was the commander of Joint Task Force Katrina 17 years ago, and he joins us now for his insight on Ian. Uh, General Honore, always good to have you on the show. Um, it, we really appreciate your time. You sent out a tweet yesterday, and I want our viewers to take a look at it, uh, saying if Hurricane Ian comes in as a Category 4 or 5, what damage it will do that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis needs to contact FEMA and to get the Defense Department involved. Hurricane Ian made landfall uh, as a Category 4. So how satisfied are you with Florida's response so far? And are there any areas that you see that uh, can be bolstered up a bit? Well, I think Doug Florida has done a good job of preparing uh, with the assets from uh, FEMA and all the agencies, the core engineers, to get the right pieces in place based on the estimate of what they thought was going to happen. They also have deployed a joint uh, combined search and rescue headquarters in Miami to collaborate the search and rescue missions uh, in and around the affected area. But this is a very big piece of real estate that this storm has come in and destroyed uh, at landfall, the grid uh, to include transportation grid, the electric power grid, the communications grid, the water grid, and the reports this morning that several hospitals uh, in and around landfall need to be evacuated. Uh, one of the things I hope to see happening today is that the Department of Defense will deploy ships in uh, a recommendation made a few days ago on social media through Twitter that they have ships follow the hurricane in. We use them very effectively days after Katrina. Uh, we had over a dozen ships deployed, particularly the what we call affectionately that Gator Navy, those uh, logistics helicopter landing decks like the Wasp which uh, have Marines on board with landing crafts that could come in and assist the first responders who are going to have a tremendous task. There's old rule of warfare from Napoleon. The first rule is you got to get there. And that's the challenge going cross country, trying to get into the coastal communities. That's where the ships would come in handy and possibly deploying a hospital ship to help take care of that area for those people that's going to be working there as well as the first responders who will have to go door to door in the coming days to check every house because communications is down. People don't have a way to communicate whether they're safe or whether they need help. So it's going to be a massive effort way beyond what we have to do in Katrina with a very large population over a very all the way across the state of Florida that flooded. So it's an enormous task. They've got the right team. Florida has well organized at the city and county level, good communications between those headquarters. The problem is they won't have the ability to communicate with the people because much of the cell service grid is down, and that's how America communicates today. So getting some of those cell towers up will give them a better feel for where people are and those that might still need help. But it's an enormous task. And my hat's off to the first responders today because they're going to have to get into those areas and try to assess what's going on. I would suspect any minute you'll start seeing Coast Guard helicopters hovering over uh, the affected area to start doing some search and rescue. And that's why I wanted you to walk us a little bit more through that. You mentioned a second or two about going door to door, literally, uh, because on this first full day in the areas that were hard hit, this today we will learn the full extent of the devastation. Once those waters have receded and the sun is up, uh, officials literally have to comb the storm path and find out exactly all that's gone wrong and lives that still may be in danger and, and, and helping people. Walk us through that process a little bit, uh, what the immediate aftermath, the immediate recovery uh, looks like there on the ground in the hardest hit areas. What will officials do uh, all day today there on the ground in places like Fort Myers? Well, the first case is get to those hospitals that don't have power and don't have electricity. Uh, needless to say, that is going to be a priority. Uh, and then to start responding to people who may have texted in as the storm was happening, requesting to be rescued. 
Uh, and then the door to door search, uh, that will start probably in the next 24 to 36 hours, but it's going to take a large concentration of troops. Uh, the Florida had 5,000 National Guard well positioned with the right equipment. The search and rescue teams, I think there's three of them from the national teams. They're probably going to need more because every door is going to have to be knocked on. And then following that search, the secondary search, you're going to have to go in those homes and see if anybody's in them. So that has to be refined. So they've got their work cut out for them. The good news is Florida is organized at the state, county, and city level. They practice and train on this and they have a doctrine to execute it. The challenge is going to be is getting there with the road networks inside the landfall area to get to the people that need help. And they're going to have to go seek them out and knock on doors because people could not communicate. And those that could not come out the house and wave somebody down. So that's why you're going to have to go to every home. That's the primary search uh, and every building and go in every room and every hotel that might have been evacuated to make sure nobody's there. So it's an enormous task. But the, the talent is there. They know what to do. The problem is going to be communications. We've got a Cajun Navy SAR team down there. That's moving through, but they got spotty communication because they rely on cell service. We're going to have to invest more in our first responders to have satellite uh, comms that are more readily available and dispersed among the first responders. And that's a lesson we'll learn, and we'll fix this one on the next time around. And I hope we adopt a policy in America. Uh, I talked to Senator McCain some years ago after Katrina that we should put in the National Defense Authorization Act that the Navy and the Pentagon would always have the landing deck craft follow hurricanes uh, ashore, those that are hurricane strength three or four. He and I never got that work done, but that's on my bucket list to go to the Congress and put that in the National Defense Authorization Act, directing the Department of Defense to have naval vessels ready to follow hurricanes into our major metropolitan areas when they're in this strength. Yeah. All right. Lieutenant General Russell Honore, former commander of the Joint Task Force, Katrina, as always, thank you for your expertise and your insight. We appreciate you coming on the show. Good luck to the first responders. Be safe, Florida. God bless you. Absolutely. Thank you. Jay. As more workers stay home to work remotely, smaller cities and towns see the new remote workforce as an opportunity to build its population and its tax base. Using financial incentives and offering a better quality of life, these communities are luring workers to a variety of locations that no one will ever confuse with New York City. How about Topeka, Kansas, for one, offering 10,000 bucks towards your home purchase. Stillwater, Oklahoma's package includes two, uh, five grand toward a home purchase and $2,000 free coffee. Sign me up for that. Morgantown, West Virginia offers an incentive package worth $20,000, which includes $12,000 cash and some great incentives to moves like smaller towns like Montpelier, Vermont, or even Augusta, Maine. Christopher Bland is an environmental scientist with the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital. He moved from New York City to Tulsa, Oklahoma last January. Full disclosure, love Tulsa, Oklahoma, lived there for several years. Great town. But why did you leave New York and why did you settle on Tulsa? Well, honestly, in New York, um, it's really kind of, it's really hard living. It's very harsh living. It's a lot of survival that needs to happen, right? And so I value my space, uh, my privacy, and my silence. And New York, that comes at a very, very, very high premium. Um, and I was able to get all of that by moving to Tulsa. So what type of incentives did Tulsa offer? Right. Well, aside from the, uh, the $10,000 cash, um, they also do provide a yearly um Membership to 36 North, which is a co-working space um, that allows us to go into an office-type setting unless we, in case we needed that, um, which is really helpful. And also, um, just the program itself does a lot in order to build community. Um, so there's a weekly events, there's weekly happy hours that are funded by the program. Um, there's a weekly events that are fun, funded by the program in order to really build a sense of community here. So really, that's one of the biggest incentives is, is kind of really already a built-in a mechanism to really um, introduce community. So take me through the process. Are you shopping around the country, looking at different incentives, looking at different towns, or how did it work for you? 
Well, actually, when, when I replied, which was about last November, actually a year, a year ago, um, there wasn't many that, that I was kind of aware of. I know Tulsa Remote was kind of the biggest one. And honestly, um, it was on a whim. Um, I had looked up a Yahoo article that basically said some extra ways to make money during the pandemic, and Tulsa Remote was on it. And it really was a uh, kind of jumped in with two feet, but one of the best decisions that ever made. Um, and so I really wasn't afraid of moving to a different place that was something uh, somewhere kind of different than I normally um, was used to. Um, so I was really welcome in the change and really leaned into it. So clearly you're adjusting well to Tulsa, but what happens when remote work ends? When remote work ends, or will you have to go back? Um, not at this time. Um, that is something that my job has uh, placed in so where we're completely remote at this point. Um, and so I don't have any type of worry of us going back into the office anytime soon. Okay, Christopher Bland, one tip for you. Mahogany Steakhouse in Tulsa. Maybe some hideaway pizza, two of my favorite places on the earth. Okay, Christopher oh, Bland mind. moved from New York uh, to Tulsa. Appreciate you joining us here on the show. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good luck. Oh, that made me hungry. <laughs>